Hello and welcome. Welcome to some great women of the Torah world. Uh, this is a class years in the making. Uh, I just first wanted to say that uh, the class is being sponsored by the White family um, uh, in the merit of a speedy recovery for Vicky White, Haya Hinda Bat Rasha, Rufu Shlema Bukharov. Uh, this, uh, as I was saying, this is a class that is years in the making. I noticed many years ago that there are very few history books about great Jewish women in the Torah world. There are, there are a few, uh, and we even have some in the shul. But when I asked the particularly wise, liberal-minded rabbi why that is, he thought about it for a moment, and then he said, I guess we don't want girls to get the wrong idea. So that answer bothered me. Uh, for several years now, I've been struggling with what the wrong idea actually is. What's, what, what could possibly be the wrong idea? So the best that I could come up with is that although basic knowledge of Torah and Jewish law are necessary for men and women, obviously, it seems that a, certainly a higher level of academic Torah scholarship is a requirement that's generally, generally placed on men. Uh, anybody can be a scholar, but men are almost like required to be scholars. And that's different. So we don't want that wrong idea, perhaps. Uh, that's perhaps what he meant. Um, uh, but the same level of scholarship uh, has not been expected of every woman, but has been seen, obviously, among many exceptional women. And in the secular world, uh, many of you might know, there's an author by the name of Virginia Woolf. Well, about 100 years ago, back in 1929, she wrote an essay that she said that there would have been a female Shakespeare had she had a, quote, room of her own, a room of one's own. In other words, opportunities need to exist to allow women to excel in Torah scholarship. As we shall see, uh, in direct conflict with the movie Gentle, opportunities indeed existed to allow the women we are about to learn about to excel in Torah scholarship. I want to thank our speakers. We're going to have Sandra Nitiel Deron. We're going to have uh, Rebecca Press, Zavi Goodwin, Shane Del Sus, uh, Benji Sus, Kaya Goodwin, Sarah Piha, and Esther Ariella Cragen. I want to thank them uh, from off the bat. Um, they took on the important task of taking on this false narrative that fully observant women do not have or have never had an opportunity and an important role in teaching and promoting Torah. Uh, this class is not exhaustive and is therefore titled Some Great Women of the Torah World. If this proves successful, uh, we can hopefully have future classes in the years to come, to learn more about uh, the Maiden of Lumir, Flora Sassoon, Esther Youngrice, Tekora Gottlieb, and some other great women of the Torah world. So with no further ado, I'm going to uh, pin the Darones. Uh, and uh, let them do the talking for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, just a moment. There we go. Uh, I have to remove my pin. One second. Oh. There you go. Ready? Yeah. Okay. So Etl and I together chose a woman whose name is Osnat Barzani. And Etl found a picture of her. I don't know if you can see her. Yes. Yeah. They see what you see. Okay. This is th this is Osnat. Uh, she was a Jewish Kurdish female rabbinical scholar and poet who lived near Duhok, Kurdistan. Um, so before I actually talk for about five minutes, it's not going to be longer than that. Um, I'm going to ask you to think about this question as you hear the brief talk that I will give after that. The question that I have is, would there be a problem amongst orthodoxy today or orthodox Jews today if Osnat Barzani lived today? Would there be a problem? with what she does. Okay, 
So she was born into the Barzani family, a well-known Kabbalistic family of rabbis in Northern Kurdistan in 1590. Her grandfather, we're gonna talk about two men, her grandfather, her, her, her father, and then her husband. Her grandfather, Rabbi Natanel Halevi, was the leader of the Jewish community in Mosul and was a holy man in the eyes of the Jews in Kurdistan. Due to the honor of his teachings, he was called Adoni. His son, the father of Osnat, Rabbi Samuel Barzani, was troubled by the lack of Torah among the Jews of Kurdistan and by the lack of spiritual leaders and halachic judges. He established, this is now the father, he established a number of yeshivot in Barzan, one of the cities in northern, northern Iraq, Acre, Ahmadiyya, and in Mosul. Most of you have probably heard of the city of Mosul, probably not have heard about the other four, three cities, in order to cultivate wise students who could serve the public as rabbis, cantors, and butchers. <laughs> the meeting was held with donations from Jewish philanthropists living in the area and Rabbi Samuel used this money for the yeshivot, um, for, for his yeshivot. Rabbi Samuel Barzani taught his daughter, the, the uh, Osnat Barzani, the Torah thoroughly to prepare her for uh, his successor as he had no sons. According to us, not herself, she did not learn any craft because she spent all her time learning Torah. She described her upbringing uh, as such. I never left the entrance to my house or went outside. I was like a princess of Israel. I grew up on the laps of scholars anchored to my father of blessed memory. I was never taught any work but sacred study. So Barzani Osnat was married to her cousin, Rabbi Jacob Mizrahi, who promised her father that she would do no domestic work, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and could spend her time as a Torah scholar. After her father's death, her husband became head of the yeshiva in Mosul. He was so involved in his studies that she essentially taught the yeshiva students and provided them with rabbinic training. Following her husband's death, the leadership of the yeshiva passed to her naturally, and eventually she became known as the, as the chief teacher of Torah. As neither her father nor her husband had been successful fundraisers, the yeshiva was always in financial difficulties. And Barzani wrote a number of letters requesting funds in which she described her and her children's difficult situation. Her home and belongings had been confiscated, including her books, but she felt that as a woman, it was inappropriate for her to travel in search of financial support. So now Etl is going to say a few words. Now, the letter she wrote for money was in, uh, in a, uh, it's a po poemic uh, style, and the music reflect the Sephardic uh, Jewish people that live in Spain at that time. And it is a sample of a poem. This is what she wrote. This is not her voice. There you go. <laughs> Shah 
הפקה לי זמני גם חד לי. אני עמדתי במצב צרות, הקיפוני את ידיי רגלי. תיקנתי עמודי הארץ, אז אציב דיינים בפלילי. running the yeshiva and feeding her kids. That's the poem description. I don't know who wrote the music. She did. Oh, oh the music. Man. That's not clear. Words, yeah, they, okay. Okay, so now I continue. In spite of the financial problems, she successfully ran the yeshiva, which continued to produce serious scholars, including her son, whom she sent to Baghdad, where he continued the dynasty of rabbinic scholars. Her few existing writings demonstrate a complete mastery of Hebrew, Torah, Talmud, Midrash, as well as Kabbalah. And her letters are not only erudite, but also lyrical. She was given the title Tana Tanait, the female form for a Talmudic scholar and a rare honor for a Jewish woman. She was also known as you heard already as a poet. She is said to have authored a piyut, which is a liturgical poem in Kurdish called Ga'agua Litzion, Longing for Zion. So that's, that's what I wanted to share with you today. And I wanted to go back and open it up to anyone who would like to try to respond to the question, would there be a problem amongst Orthodox Jews today if Osnat Barzani uh, lived today? What do you think? I think that like what we were just hearing, like a lot of um, she'd be more accepted or like, it, I mean, it, very influential. I didn't even realize very, very interesting thing. Right, very influential. Mm -hmm. If she'd be allowed to. Would she be allowed in the Orthodox community to do what she did? No. <laughs> Who's that? Who's no? Who said no? No, well, one thing I think it'll be no, because there are rabbis. In her case, there was no one to replace her. So she she was in a situation that she has to fill the void. I mean, I I, uh, I said no. It's, it's Julie, sorry. Uh, oh, hi, Judith. Hi, how are you? I don't think it would be accepted because, like, I mean, he said there's rabbis. And second, I mean, how would she teach or... I mean, I don't know. I don't think that would be very easy. I'm not sure that it says rabbis. It says she was a Jewish Kurdish female rabbinical scholar. No, no, yes, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm telling like he will be taking the job of of somebody that could be like you know like a rabbi. I'm not telling that she would be a rabbi, but how come she be teaching? or i don't know i see it very complicated so far you know even the schools are not the boys and girls so uh -huh. i don't know maybe maybe i'm i'm, I'm so not. She, she would be teaching religious um yeshiva students who are males yeah i don't see a problem but i don't know if it we accept it or easily accept it yeah no, she would not she would not be accepted for sure not yeah, <laughs> but maybe I don't see a problem at all. World, but, uh... Maybe like the modern Orthodox world, but in the ultra Orthodox world, I can tell you that ultra Orthodox um, males they won't even hear a female speak. They will only yeah. uh -huh. go to speeches run by males. So who's, who's then, talking? I'm yeah. curious to see who's talking. Hi, Avital. I come to oh, the speeches every week. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm Shandel's friend. Okay, hi, Avital. Hi, yeah. Unfortunately, she would not be accepted, even though what she's doing should be accepted. Um, 
I mean, like there are, I do know of a girl actually my age, a woman, she's 23 years old and she actually learns Gemara and she's getting like smicha or something like that. But like, and for most, for the most like Orthodox people, besides my orthodoxy, like she's not going to be accepted in the ultra Orthodox circles, even if she's more well-versed in Torah knowledge than other people. We have to, we have to remember though, that these terms, modern Orthodox, uh, ultra Orthodox, these are media terms. They're not, they're not real. No, they, they never existed. And so, for example, one of the people we haven't learned about, uh, we're not learning about today, but uh, one, of, one of the women that we could have been learning about is uh, the daughter of the altar of Chelm, uh, the altar of Chelm, who had a yeshiva. The Chelm yeshiva was a famous, very important yeshiva in the beginning of about 100 years ago. And his daughter taught there, taught the boys there. It's, it's I mean, it, it, it is possible and it has happened before. And hopefully, uh, Classes like this might change them. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I think it's a good time now to turn to um, to our next speaker, uh, Rebecca Press, speaking about Bertha Pappenheim. Hey everyone. So, oh, Rabbi, I can't share the screen. Speak. Hold on, working on it. Yeah, by now. Okay. Can you see it? We see something. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Perfect. So Today I'm going to be talking about Bertha Pappenheim, and she is a woman that is often neglected by Jewish history. She's a very uh, important woman who really saved the, the daughters of Israel in many ways. So in the late 1880s, and there was a large problem sleep, sweeping the globe, and that is called the white slave trade. And what this problem really comprised up uh, of was that Jews were guilty of selling their fellow Jew to slavery. So the main women who appear in this time actually are appearing in sort of a counterculture way to save the young girls and women who were being neglected by the larger kahilas and communities in society. So while the boys would often, they would get sent to Cheder and they would make the pilgrimage from time to time for Hagim to see Rebbe's, the women were actually left alone in the homes and often Shabbat or Hag services were unmarked. People were not celebrating or the women were not celebrating and they weren't being educated. So all the girls, um, regardless of location from the shtetls where mm -hmm. Beis Yaakov comes from to the city of Vienna where Bertha was born, the Jewish women were not being served by their society and their community. In fact, their lives were endangered by the same people that are supposed to protect them. And Bertha was a product of the system. So from the ages of 16 to 22, she took care of her father day and night until it diseased her mind. I'm talking about she would not sleep for days and weeks. She started seeing hallucinations. She became paralyzed. She was not even able to drink water. And this medical case is actually what she's most famous for. She's known as Anna O. And we learn about her through the diaries written by Dr. Joseph Breuer, who is the grandfather of psychoanalysts. He was Freud's professor. So the two actually created the sort of cathartic uh, talking release. And this was done by, Breuer uh, was a family friend and he would come over and while she was paralyzed and able to drink water, he would hallucinate her and they would start discussing the initial encounter with water that dissuaded her. So through this, the two talked out the problems and that, that's what she's most known for. But I think we could look at this application of her life, this lens that completely violates HIPAA laws today and we can see how this was a young girl, 16, 22 year old, who cared for her father. Her father passed away 
She's left having to take care of her mother, and we get an insight on what her mental state was like and what probably many girls of the time was going through, even though she came from a court Jew family and a very strictly orthodox one. She was well off in Vienna. She was still suffering. And from this, we can see how she transforms her suffering into what she would found as the Jewish Women's League. So she saw the institutions that the Goyim had started, that they had orphanages, that they had charities. And while she was working at a soup kitchen with her mother for, for money and for food after her father passed away, she wanted to create and facilitate the communal responsibility and obligation for the young Jewish girls that the rest of the world was passing up. So here on the slide, you can see a few things that she instituted in Germany in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And when we read them, we'll find that they're actually still problems that women are facing today. So a daycare center, an infant feeding station. I mean, one can recall that just recently the United States ran out of baby formula. So still women are not being prioritized and taken care of. She started a commission to protect children international outreach for Jews in Eastern Europe who are being ravaged by pogroms and all the most terrible things. And her organization would protest against the establishment of official brothels. Because like I said earlier, the white slave trade was raging at this time. And many girls were either getting tricked or sold into slavery, especially Jewish girls. So her campaign blended two major concerns the status of Jewish women and the fight against anti-Semitism. She instituted organizations that sought to alleviate the economical and social conditions that pushed Jewish women into the traffic and create spaces where they could learn and they would be protected from those who wanted to harm them and pull them into the, the sex slavery. She taught ways to help women get employment. And she also wanted to expose even the Jewish individuals who are perpetrating this crime against their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. So Bertha Pappenheim is much more than just a medical case or the cathartic way that we talk out our problems. She instituted social reforms for women. She established communities. She established places that young girls could go to and escape from the pipeline to poverty and to sex trafficking that was going on. And so I, I would like to follow Sandy's lead, which was absolutely amazing, and, and ask the group too, what do you think we can do for the girls of today? Do you think this is defeating society pushing girls into selling their bodies? Women, help them and protect them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't hear the last few words. I'm sorry. Oh, I was applying the modern look and saying that we're learning about these great Jewish women. And as Sandra pointed out, would this be allowed today? So I want to also ask the group. What can we do for young Jewish women today in their role in society that's maybe pulling them in a thousand different directions, like the young Jewish girls of Bertha Pappenheim's time? How can we support our young girls and put them on the right derech and protect them? I think being more open, I don't know, like being more open with like their questions. Um, and again, I like having this forum, like having them look into research and understanding other other people in society who have like made leadership positions. Uh, it's so so interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Shanda. That was a great answer. I completely agree with you. Dialogue is the number one way that, that we're gonna heal and let Jewish women really thrive in Judaism and let them take the responsibilities and the roles that are so wonderful. Amen. Um, you mentioned in, uh, in your talk, you mentioned Eastern Europe, and you mentioned the shtetls uh, that uh, brought 
uh, brought about Sarah Shanir. And luckily we have somebody speaking about her, Zavi's turn. Yay, I just have to figure out how to share my screen. Let's see. Oh, share screen. screen. It's right here. Okay. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Now I just have to figure out where to present. Okay. Okay. Oops. I think it's getting cut off. Um, so I've, I have the honor of talking, speaking about Sarah Schneer, um, who is the founder of the Base Yaakov movement, as well as uh, really the leader in Jewish girls' education. Um, and a lot of it actually um, cuts into what Rebecca was just speaking about. So let's get into this. Okay. So she was born in uh, Krakow in 1883 to the parents of Rabbi Bitzalel HaKohen and Rosalia Schneer. Uh, she was, her parents are, were followers of uh, Bel's Chassidim as well as the Sans Chassidim. Um, and she was one of nine children. Um, so at this time, like Rebecca was, was just saying, uh, many of the girls weren't able to be, weren't able to have a formal Jewish education. Um, there was a government mandate uh, that made all of children going ages from six to 14. Um, they had to be educated through the public school system. And a lot of the boys were able to get out of this and they were able to, um, they were able to be placed into cheders and yeshivas, um, but it wasn't so accessible for the girls. And uh, a lot of the a lot of the Jewish communities believed that it, it wasn't necessary for girls to have the formal Jewish education, as well as it might not even be allowed. Um, so they believed that um, the girls should just learn from their mothers in the homes of how, and learn how to, you know, become a good Jewish girl and keep a home and everything like that um, and learn what not to do and what to do just by watching. Um, and Sarah saw that uh, this was actually extremely problematic. Um, the girls didn't really have much of a connection to Judaism and, um, and you know, they were in a place where in the public schools, they were really assimilated and a lot of their classmates were not Jewish and um, they were learning all secular subjects. Um, and, it was just much harder to um, like have a great foundation of Judaism with you know laws and connection and everything. Um, so in 1903, a conference took place in Krakow. Um, it was a rabbinical conference. And one of the delegates who was there uh, raised his hand and said, you know, uh, I think one of the problems within the Jewish world is that we don't have a good education system for young Jewish girls. Uh, and how most people disagreed with him. They said, no, you know, I, we don't think it's problematic enough um, and they'll continue to learn at home. They thought it was still a safe space and um, it wasn't influential, like the public schools weren't influential enough to cause any, to cause enough harm. Um, so by the time Sarah was in eighth grade, she had to leave school uh, due to financial hardships at home, and uh, she found work as a seamstress. So, um, so a lot of her friends were becoming less interested, and, you know, thank God she was still very interested, but um, she saw that, you know, over the, high ho over the holidays, over Shabbat, there would be an emptiness, um, just, again, just as Rebecca was saying, just as the boys would be going to shul and learning with the rabbis and, you know, singing, learning, davening, all of this, all of the women would be at home kind of doing nothing, getting food prepared, but that was pretty much it. So she asked her father um, to teach her just basic Jewish subjects in Yiddish. So, so a couple of the things that she noted that she learned 
um, in Yiddish were Tzana Orna and Chokli Yisrael, which are both um, translations of just like portions of the Chumash, of the Navi, Gemara, Mishnah. Um, and so in World War I, she fled to Vienna and she, she found uh, the works of Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, who his works weren't available in Poland at that time. And, um, you know, he was seen to be a revolutionist in himself in his times as well. Um, he was very much into being a cultured person and being very well learned in, in uh, secular and Judaic subjects. Um, and she really was encouraged by this. She wanted to take everything she had learned from him back to Poland. Um, and she wanted to try teaching people, girls in Poland on her own. So she went back, she failed the first couple of times she tried. People were making fun of her. They called her, you know, you're too religious. Um, and even her brother said, you know, this might not be the best idea for you. Maybe go to the Bells Rebbe and get his advice. And the brother thought that the Bells Rebbe would try discouraging her from continuing to teach people. But um, instead, he ended up giving her a blessing. He said, you should be blessed and you should have lots of success in what you do. And that was just one of the first of the rabbis who gave her approval. Uh, she got approvals from people, from rabbis such as like the Gera Rebbe, Rav Alchanan Wasserman, and the Chafetz Chaim. And uh, it should be noted that the Chafetz Chaim was also huge on, he he called for a lot of reform within the Jewish woman's education. So, um, so in 1917, uh, Sarah Schneer had her first 25 students. Many of them came from uh, daughters of her clientele from her seamstress business. Um, and so a lot of towns started hearing about all of that she had to offer um, and they wanted in. So. So um, on the left, you can see there's this building. Um, I'm standing in front of it with a lot of my friends from seminary. We're in Poland. Um, and this is actually the building, one of the buildings that they used to have these teacher training programs. Um, they needed a lot of teachers because the word was spreading so quickly. So they had these older girls. Um, Sarah Schneer trained them properly um, how to teach the, the kids. And in 1924, Aguda Yisrael of Krakow, which is Aguda Yisrael is still a very prominent um, organization today. They actually wanted Beis Yaakov to come under their wing and become a part of them. So, um, so they included things such as like childcare, um, you know, daycares, like after school, they had normal schools, they had a lot of outreach, uh, so on and so forth. And in 1937, Beis Yaakov grew to 35,000 students and 248 different schools. So that's just by 1937, and we're in 2022 now. So imagine um, all of, of what she's influenced and what she's started. So Sarah Schneer, in the end of the day, she saw a problem. She wanted to fix it, and um, she found a solution. She found people to help back her. and. Without her, I don't even know where we'd be, but thank God, like, I think that was one of the first things that, that I think um, is a huge game changer of what we've, we've made is we now have education for girls, you know, all over the world. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a lot to think. Um, and with that said, um, yeah, if you see a problem, doesn't matter where it is in the Jewish world, in the world, we see a problem, we want, let's be the change, let's fix it, and um, yeah, find solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Zavi. Thank I you. have a question. Um, how many uh, Beit Yaakov schools are there today throughout the world? Do you have any idea? I, I haven't, I totally, I'm not sure. I, I, can to, I can get back to you after this class, hopefully. Because my granddaughter, went to a Sephardic uh, Beit Yaakov. They, they, I don't know how long ago they established it, not just Ashkenazi, but for Sephardic girls as well. Also called Beit Yaakov. 
Yeah, yeah. they're all over. All over. Yeah. yeah. I have I have a comment to make. Um, I don't remember where I learned this from, but I definitely heard this from a reliable source that, you know, when they were preparing these young women to be teachers, some of them weren't even much older than their students. So to get, gain the respect of the students, I, um, you know, Sarah Schneerson would, you know, doll them up, put, you know, put, give them like high heels and put on some makeup and do their hair to you know to command some you know to make it seem like these young ladies were like grown women you know so i don't remember eddie do you remember where we learned this from or were you not well it was rabbi holland there there you go remember learning it from a so it's a peculiar how you know these women were pioneers and uh did a tremendous work and were so daring and, and courageous, you know, so something to learn for from. Thank you. Thank you, Zavi. Thank you. Okay, um, the next few uh, speakers, um, in fact, all of the remaining speakers, if you think about it, um, they're all um, the results of uh, Sarah Shunir's work in a way. So it's, it's a very good segue from, from sort of like the, the more ancient world and leading right into um, our, our current situation. We, uh, we're up to uh, Shane Delsas. He's going to speak about one of, uh, one of my favorite uh, teachers. He's called the Mora uh, Nahama Leibowitz. Thank you. I, when I saw the name, I was so excited because um, I actually took a class about Jewish um, halachas and, and whatnot in, uh, in in undergrad, and I remember my my teacher uh, Rabbi Miller. He would always bring up like randomly quotes, and his, he'd say Nechama Leibowitz, and I'd say, "What? There's a Jewish commentator, and Nechama Leibowitz is a girl." That's so. Remember, my husband would give that, would give our class for the parsha, and and quote Nechama Leibowitz. So it was really cool to um, gain that. Learning and it's interesting on that note that um, actually a guy, uh, one of her students, or had read her commentary, or a student from later on read her commentary and was so inspired by it, wanted to give it over to his students, but felt a little embarrassed that he would be quoting a woman. So he actually quoted her saying Reb Nachman. So, you know, you already can see how interesting and um, Kind of out of the blue it was to have a woman commentator on the Torah. Um, so Nahama Leibowitz, she lived from the years 1903 to 1997, uh, which is fascinating because I was born in 1997, so um, Leibowitz came from a merchant family in Riga, Latvia, the younger sister of the philosopher Yishai Leibowitz. Um, and so her, she both, uh, both of her and her brother both got private tutoring in Latvia, which wasn't uncommon. Like back then you learned through um, private tutoring. Again, um, as other people said, usually, you know, women didn't have that education. So when there was private tutoring, they tutored both, I guess. Um, the Leibowitz family then moved to Berlin in 1919 when Nechama was 14. Um, and she had private tutoring, but then she received um, higher education after that. Like it wasn't just her, her family was very into education. Um, and she actually had got an academic high school. She went to academic high school and university in German public institutions from 1920 to 1928. So she actually was very um, different in that time, like getting, getting an education at that time. Um, and in 1930, she got or received a doctorate from the University of Marburg for her thesis, Techniques in the Translation of Jewish, German Jewish Biblical Translations. So, you know, we're not, you know, it was, it was even unheard of to have like a higher education, let alone, you know, a doctorate. Um, but her, you know, her family loved education, loved Israel. And so um, they were like Zionistic, as you would say. Um, and uh, they, she moved, her and her family moved in 1930 with her husband, Yadida, Yadidia Lipman Leibowitz, who was actually her uncle. I, I hear a lot of like everyone marrying family members. So there, there was another one. 
Um, through so as she had her education and she wanted to teach in Israel, but like before it was an actual um, state. Uh, she had a hard time uh, teaching. She, uh, a lot of stigma was against her um, due to her religious stance at the time and also being a woman. Um, so it was harder for her to get teaching jobs, but then she did. And she taught in many schools throughout Israel, uh, institutions and colleges. Uh, her love for Israel, and um, she had such a love for Israel, she never even left Israel. Like she said, once she's there, like that's where she needs to be. She was very, she was very into everyone making Aliyah. Um, even, even her commentary, I, I noticed that. So I actually had to do um, a paper on her when I was in Rabbi Miller's class in undergraduate school. And I, I noticed, um, I looked back at my commentary from her and it, it was saying that um, she had brought an explanation from Rabbi Hoffman, another commentator, on why a dove was brought as a korban. So at the time, based on my paper in the past, it was on a, a dove, uh, all the korbanim. And one of, one of the things was why was a dove brought? Um, and how, he, well, she was connecting to Rabbi Hoffman saying that a dove represents homesickness, why? It says that when the Jews travel back to Eretz Israel, when the Mashiach comes, the non-Jews will say, who are these that fly up like a cloud and like doves to their nests? Just, and so she said, Eretzistral is our homeland, and doves always fly back to their homeland. Just as the woman, um, so my paper was about women giving birth and then having to give a korban. So just as a woman wasn't allowed to come into the Mishkan when she gave birth, she was now given the opportunity right after birth to re-enter and come back to her homeland. So mm -hmm. that 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 little commentary brought an idea of how much she thought about Israel in her commentary, how she noticed that like the dove, Eretz Israel is our homeland. So she she very much believed that it is. Um, uh, so she was good at trying to make, so she was very good at trying to make the Chumash as commentary applicable to everyone and uh, have people think about it. But at the time, a, a lot of the Israelis at the time you know, thought it was, it was just like an old book, you know, a story from, of their childhood, like little fairy kind of, you know, that you read at night versus no, there's, there's actual understanding and there's, there's something we can gain from it. You can have it applicable to your life and also just investigate. Everyone is able to investigate um, on their own. Like, what does this mean? How do, how do, what, what, what questions can we have on that? Um, uh, so she write commentary on her Torah understandings and, and she would teach it to her students. And actually it was, it's fascinating that her students, when they graduated from her classes, they, they asked her, please, can you send us like your, your teachings that you teach in your classes and your lessons, because we want more. And she actually would write to each one of them. She had it said that like, she had such pleasure, um, writing down these pages and sending it to her past students. So I, I love that, that she had a, a continuing connection with her students. Um, I, it was interesting, another thing that she, another Torah part that she brought up is um, like what, what we were saying, like women at the time could just have been said that they were just for doing, um, you know, staying in the house, having children. And she kind of was a little bit, um, she believed a little bit more than that. And she brought that up in um, in the Pasuk uh, in Voracious, Perik uh, 30 Pasuk <laughs> Aleph through base. Sorry, Perik Lamed. Um, and it says, and uh, this was when uh, Rachel was asking Yaakov for children. And Rachel, and it says, and Rachel saw that she had none born any children to Yaakov. And Rachel envied her sister. And she said to Yaakov, give me children. And if not, I am dead. And Yaakov became angry with Rachel. And he said, am I instead of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she actually commented on this. She, she said she was, um, in her commentary, she sided with Yaakov. You know, it's interesting being a woman and, and wanting to, to be for women, like you'd think he would, she would be on Rachel's side, but she was actually on Yaakov's side because she put that, Rachel said that if I don't have children, I'm gonna die. Like there's no other purpose for me. And he said, no, there's not, Yaakov said, no, you don't just have a purpose to have children. You have more than that. You can, um, 
you can pray to God, you know, he was, and, and like, she thought that that was, uh, she had that idea from what Yaakov had said. Um, she was a very humble woman. She lived in a tiny apartment in Israel. And when she passed it, it said that, um, I actually saw a picture on her tombstone. It only has one word. It says her name and Mora, what Rabbi Rosenberg was saying, um, because that's all she wanted to herself to be known as is just a teacher. And, you know, many people could have written so much about her, but that's all she had. She was very humble, very simple. Um, and she was a mother. And she, so um, she didn't have any children. She did say that um, someone had asked her about her children and like, actually about like all the commentary she wrote. And she said, I would, you know, I would give it up just to have children. But at the same time, she uh, was a mother to her students. Her students thought of themselves as her children. And when she passed away, her nephew um, said to everyone at the funeral, they said, if anyone feels deeply that that she was their mother, they could say the Kaddish. And like a bunch of people in the, in at the, at, at the um, funeral, sorry, <laughs> um, said Kaddish in unison. So you see that she made like such an intense impact to everyone there. Um, and that's what I gained from it. Thank you. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, so we're, I don't need to pin uh, the screen to uh, somebody else. We're going to <laughs> go straight to, uh, to Benji, who's going to speak about somebody who lived not so long ago. Uh, Henny Machlis, please. Sorry, <laughs> I was okay. on mute. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Rabbi Rosenberg mentioned, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about Henny Machlis. Um, and everyone knows her as um, the, the woman who hosted hundreds of uh, people in her Yerushalayim apartment every week um, from all walks of life. Um, but hopefully I'm gonna try to give people um, a picture of like different aspects of her um, being additional. And I'm gonna try to share very briefly like one or two of her Torah teachings as well. Um, so Henny was born in Crown Heights um, and then her and her husband, uh, Rabbi Mordechai, um, moved to Yerushalayim, where everyone, uh, where, where she was famous for, uh, for those meals, the, the Machlis meals. Um, one cute story, which actually um, is a, a true story. Um, I, I was reading like um, a biography on Henny, um, and it also ties into Shavuos, and it also tells us about like Henny's love for Torah. Um, it, it explains that like when when her husband and her were set up to date, initially her husband was reluctant, but upon hearing that Henny stayed up all night, Shavuos night learning Torah, at that point he said, okay, like I'm willing to date her. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And it really like shows you like Henny's love for learning Torah. Um, and as we're gonna see, like she, uh, she really enjoyed teaching it as well. Um, and I was reading her biography, her meals were also a forum for everyone to uh, share their own um, Torah ideas. Like all of her guests, everyone, if they wanted, was given a chance to speak. And I thought that was really cool. Um, okay, so to share one uh, teaching, which also like gives you an idea um, of like some things that Henny felt really like strongly about. Um, Okay, so here's one of them. Um, it's that a person should view every uh, chesed opportunity as a privilege. Um, like sometimes when people come to us for help, we might be very busy or in a, in a rough mood and we might look at it um, as an annoyance. Um, but Henny taught us to really teach every chesed opportunity as a privilege. Um, and she, uh, she referenced the Havas Chesed, which was a Sefer ran by the Chavetz Chaim. Um, everyone knows about the Chavetz Chaim for his Sefer on Lashon Hara. He wrote a, a Sefer regarding like Musr and like the, the way we should uh, conduct ourselves, not just in relation to our, to our speech. Um, so in it, the Chavetz Chaim brings a mushal, a parable, um, to like, you, you have a, a merchant who's getting ready to close his store and all of a sudden somebody, uh, a big customer comes pounding on the window. 
Um, so now, is, is this merchant going to get annoyed that someone is pounding on his window? No, he's super happy to see that someone is coming in um, to uh, who, who wants to make a big purchase. So, so too, Henny was explaining, um, and the Chavetz Chaim was explaining that what Chas said, we should look at it as this uh, as this great opportunity. Um, now, I'll end off with one more similar note. Um, she quotes um, from the Zohar um, that when Hashem wants to reward a person in this world, what does he do? He sends a, a poor person to that person's door as like as an opportunity for chesed. Um, so I, I compiled a lot of other Torah thoughts, but I just wanted to keep it brief because I know there are many other speakers and I want everyone to have a chance to really share about uh, th these great uh, women throughout the generations. Thank you, bro. Oh, thank you very much. That was that was wonderful. Uh, I I didn't know like uh, I, I didn't know any that's, that that story about how I dated her because of the uh, of the staying up all night. I, I like that. See, was, so, some of us like uh, intelligent women. <laughs> some of us <laughs> like people who learn Torah. You know, <laughs> that, that that old uh, that old wives' tale is definitely uh, hopefully out the window. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work. I have a recording of uh, of Chaya Goodwin uh, speaking about Rebetzin Kanievsky. Uh, she speaks about her for a little bit, just a brief uh, personal story. But I just wanted to say that uh, recently, uh, not long ago, in fact, uh, I um, I uh, ha had the merit to uh, to review a book called Reb Chaim Kanievsky on the Sitter. And almost every other page had something from Rebetzin Kanievsky. Her stories and her inspirational Torah were a big part of, uh, of, uh, of Rav Chaim's uh, Torah. Uh, he, he would say that. So uh, I don't think I'm far off in, in saying a similar thing. So let me see. Um, I don't know how to do this, but I'll try. Uh, here we go. Everybody see this? Everybody see the video? Does anybody see the video? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. And because this is recorded, I'm going to assume yes. Thank you, Rabbi Eddie, for giving me the opportunity to speak about Rebetzin Kanievsky. She made a huge impact on my life. When I was 13, my family went on a trip to Israel. We had the privilege of meeting Rebetzin Kanievsky. When we got to her door, I noticed a huge line of women. I thought it would take hours just to meet the Robertson. Finally, we move up just a little bit on her steps. And the Robertson comes out and she walks eyes with me and she pulls me in and she's holding my hand, kissing my hand. I was shocked. I was like, she, she just took time for a 13 year old and she has all these women and she's making Shabbos. I was, I, did, I was speechless. But there's a valuable lesson that we can learn from Rebetz and Kanievsky. And that is that she made every single woman that would come to her feel special. She would make them feel some self-worth. She always knew what to say. She had the biggest heart. And she really, really made every woman feel special. You know, nowadays, we all get down, especially with social media, of not feeling great, not feeling beautiful, and not having some self-worth. But that was the opposite when it came to Rebetzin Kanievsky. She made every woman feel empowered, feel beautiful, have, have some self-esteem, and really show you your true self-worth, that you believed in yourself. And that was the power of Rebetz and Kanievsky. I want to wish you all a Chag Sameach, a Shabbat Shalom, and thank you. Bye. All right. Very nice. Uh, so, um, good job, Chaya. Um, we'll, we'll thank her in person later. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the next two people that we're going to be presenting on are people who are Baruch Hashem alive and healthy. And, uh, and it just it's it just, Goes back to that question that Sandra started us off with: Is can this be done in the Orthodox world? Well, 
Listen, there's a there's a biography, you know, there's a biography of uh, Robinson Kanievsky, right? Our school doesn't publish a biography about every woman and about every person, and uh, it must mean something that the, this this kind of thing can happen. That there, there's a change. So um, I, I recently saw an interview. Uh, Rabbi Johnny Solomon was interviewing the, our, our next uh, our next um, um, subject, whose uh, name is Jess Diner, and it's uh, being presented by Sarah Piha. It's God willing going to be a part of our community soon. Uh, so let's go, uh, so Sarah. You're on. Uh, you're muted. Man, you think I would get used to this Zoom thing by now? Um, all right, everybody. So I'm Sarah. I'm hoping to move to your community, God willing, one day. Um, I am doing Just Diner. So let me present my screen for you all. All right, so we'll start from the beginning. So this is Jess Diner. And when Rabbi gave me the name to present, um, I did a quick Google when he sent the email and I said, Rabbi, I don't think this is correct. She's like a modern day girl who works for Vogue. So um, I don't, I guess I'm failing this assignment. And he said, no, no, you're good. Here we go. So it turns out that Jess Diner actually is the wellness and beauty director for Vogue magazine in Europe. So every piece of content, whether it's in the monthly magazine that we all we all know, um, or whether it's on the internet, whether it be social media or the online portion or whatever it may be, has to go through her if it involves wellness or it involves beauty. And when we think of wellness and when we think of beauty in the in the secular world, um, you know, you always hear the phrase "sex sells," and as an Orthodox woman. Um, you can't really use that tagline so much. So what can you use for your marketing? What can you use for your, what's your vibe? What's your, what's your pitch? Who are you? Um, and Jess Diner does it in a way that has such grace that shows that with classic and modern values, she's able to take her Judaism and bring it into vogue of all places and just her entire life. So what's her story? So Jess was born in New Jersey and she lived in a um, very beautiful neighborhood, lots of families, you know, not Jewish whatsoever, um, but it was a great neighborhood. Her mother was French, her father was American and her father had a very good job. And they said, hey, you have to move to Europe for your job. They didn't really wanna go, but they had to go. And they said, all right, here's the deal. We're only happy to move to Europe, to, to England if you can find us a place that's very much like our happy New Jersey suburb. We want families, we want happiness, and we want you know the good, good vibes over there. So the company said, don't worry, we have you. You're gonna be all set. So they send her to England in this beautiful neighborhood and it has family, it has amazing people, it's safe. And guess what? It's predominantly Jewish. It is one of the most Orthodox neighborhoods you can find in England um, from what I have read. So. They took this opportunity and they just absolutely embraced it. Even though they were one of the only non-Jewish families in the neighborhood, they were invited over to other Shabbat dinners and they were going to Rosh Hashanah and all these, you know, Hanukkah, and they were really embraced by the community. Most of her friends were Jewish and they would joke that she was an honorary Jew, that she was just going through all of these things. So being in a Jewish community, being around Jewish people, uh, the inevitable happens and she falls in love with a Jewish boy. And she says, oh, man, I've been, you know, part of Judaism for so long. And I've thought about kind of becoming Jewish. But at the same time, I don't know if it's for me. I don't know what the game plan is here. And we should probably just break up because I don't I don't know what my game plan is. So poor Edward's a little bit sad about it. And she thinks about it some more and says, you know what? I think it's time. Um, I think something's pulling me to convert to Judaism. And those who know me can kind of say that it's a very similar story uh, to what I've kind of gone through. Um, and I thought this quote was just such a beautiful thing because um, I don't know how many on you are, up here are, on, are converts and how many are, are the lucky born into it ones. Um, but as a convert, sometimes you hear not very nice things or assumptions. And I thought this was such a beautiful way. And she has an English accent, so it's going to say down way better coming from her. But unfortunately, I'm going to be the one who reads it to you today. She, Ed, that's her husband. Um, Ed never asked me if I would convert, though which I always feel complete, compelled to clarify. I wanted to do it. And I have my desired Jewishness to be accepted by rabbinical authorities and our, our children to be considered Jewish and Orthodox Jewish community. The Jewish heritage is line is 
matriarchal. And so I chose to do an Orthodox conversion, a process that you have to want to embark on from the depths of your soul. It requires dedication and a desire beyond any relationship. The love of a person can definitely be part of an equation, but it's not the sum. In Judaism, you talk about things being beshert or destiny. As dramatic as it sounds, this was my destiny. And I just thought that was such a beautiful way to explain kind of how a lot of us converts feel. Um, it's different for everyone, but this, this really resonated with me. And I thought it was such a great um, way to show how Orthodox and modern life and conversions all just kind of fall into each other. So when you look at, um, if you do a quick search on Jess, it's really neat because you see so many things that are Jewish and so many things that are not Jewish, but she actually combines all of them um, into one. So, I mean, things that I kind of expected to see where, you know, I kind of expected to see at the beginning where like, you know, how to make a kugel and kind of more basic modest dressing. And, you know, you can kind of expect these things, but she's doing so many other things. She's going everything from Hermes to, to five beauty products. She does beauty reviews in a robe that's very conservative that covers everything. So she's doing so many things that girls are doing in the secular worlds that people are just overly obsessed and interested in, but she's doing it in a way that's classy and elegant and actually matters and feels important. So that's just a little bit of a kind of you just go through her. These are all articles she's published. So, so, so many good things, so many interesting things. Um, but that's not the most interesting part to her. She, um, as the Vogue um, director, uh, she talks so much about Judaism in her world, which I think is so cool. Um, in some, and it depends when, what environment she's in. So she has so many interviews with rabbis, with um, Rogue actually did an entire um, segment about her conversion. And she does so much, um, She and her major mission in Judaism and comparing it to her career, which she worked at before she was converted, during and after, was um, to find the positivity in Judaism. And she says so many people will come up and say, oh, wow, you're not allowed to do things on Shabbat. You must be miserable or you must, you know, you, you know, you have to wear dresses or things like that. And she takes these things and she turns them to the positive because I don't think any of us would want to be Jewish if we just sat there and were miserable by every single law. We want to be Jewish and we are Jewish for those of you who have converted or officially born into it. Uh, because of all the good things it brings, not because of all the things you can't do. There's so much more good than bad. And when she presents Judaism, especially because she has to within her go community, um, she really tries to enforce this. For example, people call her dress diner and raise your hand if you've ever been a victim of someone saying, oh, wow, you really like to wear dresses or wow, you really like to, you know, dress feminine. And I as an Orthodox woman, so many of us have gotten those weird comments and we have the option to either explain modesty um, in the Torah, or we just have the option to say thank you. And I think a lot of us just say thank you because no one wants to deal with all of that, uh, explaining to the secular community things. So when she is asked these questions, she handles it with such grace. Do you feel pressure to dress a certain way at work? And in her religious articles, she explains um, how how dressing modest makes her feel empowered, how it's such a strong way to dress, how it's a way to, um, as actually Esther told me this before I heard it from Jess, and it was, um, you know, to dra dress attractive, but not attracting. Um, but she'll explain things like, I like to get dressed, dressed nicely to go to work. Evenings and weekends, I'm in mom mode, very casual, go to work, dress up a little, I'm very into dresses. They're so easy. It's just one piece of clothing I don't have to worry about. I choose it the night before, so there's no guesswork or panic in the morning when I need to be focused in time with a baby. And she explains in other interviews that the reason she explains things like this is that if she said, oh, I'm Jewish, I have to wear dresses, that people would so quickly say, oh, you're so, restrict or so restricted, you must be so miserable, blah, blah, blah. And she doesn't ever want to bring that negativity onto Judaism. She wants to always move it forward in a positive direction. You see her all over social media. And everyone knows social media is such an opportunity for girls to show up off all sorts of inappropriate things. But instead of she shows it off with class and with grace. And I think if everybody took her models when it comes to her business or her career, when it comes to um, social media and things like that, um, into a way that let's make it positive and constructive and not about showing things off that shouldn't be shown off. It'd be such a more positive society. People could use it and grow instead of just, you know, 
doing it and tearing each other apart, which can be so, so awful. So that's kind of the, oh, and this is, you know, just her whole social media. She posts very often. Um, and it's always just very positive, uplifting things. Um, so that's pretty much the whole, the whole gamut. It's just about how people can, uh, especially modern women, can be in these careers, can be doing big things. It's a way more expensive society than it used to be. And unfortunately, as much as I would love to sit home and make dinner and take care of my children and do a child and do all sorts of things, uh, we have to bring extra money into the home because sometimes things aren't as cheap. So there is a way to do that in a way that's filled with grace, that's filled with um, with grace and modesty and all of those things. Um, and Judaism, she also mentions how easy it is for her to shut off from her cell phone during the day if she has a meeting, if she has family time, because she does it during Shabbat. So um, just you can do all these things in a positive and constructive way. And Judaism has actually a way to really succeed in your career and even more so succeed in your home um, instead of just letting it, using it as a deterrent. Oh, thank you. That's so interesting. I really didn't know about it. That's so cool. Thank you. Very, very well. Very thank well you done. also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, aside, aside from uh, the great presentation is this, you, you also used your own talents the graphic design of, uh, of your presentation. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, make one correction. And, and that is, you said that uh, there, we're, we're all lucky or many of us are lucky to be born Jewish, but keep in mind, most of us, uh, myself included, are Bali Teshuva, right? So we, we, even though we were biologically Jewish or whatever, we, 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 we like, just like converts, we struggled to choose this as a passion. And, uh, and, and I think it, it, this holiday that we're coming up, Shavuot, there's, there's a reason why we read the Book of Ruth now is because it's a, it's a holiday celebrating the conversion, celebrating that, that, that desire and that choice. Okay. So anyway, um, with, with that said, uh, we're, we are over time, but I will not, I will not, I'm putting my foot down, making a line in the sand. We have to hear about Lisa Aiken from Esther Ariella Cragen. Lisa Aiken is one of my go-to uh, authors to recommend to people when they ask me to recommend books, and people do rather often. So uh, we need to hear about uh, one of my favorite books. Uh, and from, where, where are you, Esther? Are you on? Oh, there you are. Okay, let me, let me, uh, let me, let me pin you. <laughs> uh, uh, there you go. All right. Hi. You're muted though, that's why. Sorry about that. Um, thank you guys all for uh, the beautiful speeches by the in this uh, panel or whatever, what are we calling it? <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I did wanna talk about Lisa Aiken and I, I wanna say thank you to Rabbi Rosenberg and uh, Sarah Piha for helping me to learn uh, learn about her. Um, we are actually, Sarah and I are learning uh, a book called To Be a Jewish Woman. And um, I very, very much, um, uh, here, I'll show it to you so that you can see it if you want to look it up. <laughs> um, I very much recommend it and you'll see, uh, Maybe you'll see why after I do a presentation with her. So she is actually from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and for the and she has her psych degree, uh, PhD um, in psychology. She has um, been practicing uh, and helping individuals for about forty years. Um, and uh, interesting, and she has uh, written and co uh, she is author and co-author about of about 11 books. Um, she also uh, is a tour guide in Israel, which is very interesting. So she has also a book on uh, being a tour guide in Israel. Um, so um, she did her, she did have her um, practice in New York City. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit more about her books. So she does have the book called To Be a Jewish Woman, which is about um, how a modern woman, a modern Jewish woman can find her place in orthodoxy. Um, and um, 
a couple, I just want to mention a couple other books because they sound interesting to me. Um, there's all, sh apparently these are also very popular, uh, a guide for the um, romantically perplexed, uh, which is basically about, uh, it's a comprehensive guide on um, counseling techniques and dating for marriage and staying married. Um, sorry, one second. Michael, can you get the name? Um, and uh, there's also a book called The Art of Jewish Prayer um, and uh, The Hidden Beauty of the Shema. Um, and one book, which is called Why Me God, Jewish, a Jewish Guide for Coping um, with Suffering. And what, uh, which is, I know is a hot topic on, uh, on a lot of uh, people, uh, people's minds all the time. Um, so I did want to read just a couple of excerpts from her book, if you would allow me, and I'll try and make it all short because I know we are um, out of time. Um, so in the beginning of her book, in the preface, she kind of talks a little bit about uh, why she decided to write um, this book called To Be a Jewish Woman. Um, and she said that in the 80s, she, um, when she was going to college, uh, sorry, in the 70s, when she was going to college, um, the women's movement was very uh, in full swing. And she said, the more she studied, the more, the more she became distressed for women, that uh, she felt that uh, she, women, Jewish women struggled. Um, she would actually lead Jewish women, Jewish minyan, Jewish women with minyanims and perform traditional Jewish rit um, rituals that men would usually perform. And then she said that she eventually uh, started learning a little bit more about uh, um, orthodoxy uh, in practice. She, she originally, um, she, she called it conservadox. So her, fam her family was kind of conservadox. Um, and coming from a family of my own, uh, my, my family was sort of conservadox, and I understand how she felt. Um, and the more she learned about Yiddishkeit, which also how I felt, um, she says, how does she say it? She, her, uh, she felt um, and she eventually discovered that uh, Observant Judaism was a complete and satisfying system in its own right. Now, this whole book goes on. Um, it's, it's actually a response to uh, the feminine movement. Uh, um, and I know there's a lot of like questions about how basically women, um, well, all we do is cook and clean and take care of children. Um, well, she covers every single one of those subjects here in this book, um, and I can tell you, like, one, in a lot of books that I read, I don't really like a whole lot of stories. She's very, like, succinct and very, has a lot of Torah knowledge and brings in um, just a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of Torah into each one of her, um, her things here. Um, I'm going to read one more thing from her, uh, just to get an idea. Um, and I think Sarah might remember this, but we both really kind of thought it was funny and that's why I wanted to read it. Um, she says, uh, it was a challenge. Uh, she used to live in Manhattan and, uh, basically she would host Shabbos all the time. And one of the biggest problems in modern society is that, uh, you know, everybody wants to know um, what you do, if you're a scholar in residence, or uh, the chief psychologist. Well, she says one week she was exhausted, and she's decided that she had no energy to be talkative and a hostess. So she decided that one day she was just going to reply when somebody asked her what she does that she was just a housewife. And it was not surprising that afterwards, nobody really, the only conversation that people asked her were about was um, uh, recipes or, or what she made for dessert and whatnot. But um, I think it's funny that she did that and she wrote this whole book about how um, 
you know, how fulfilled you can feel uh, just, you know, being a housewife and being, which is, I guess, somewhat uh, difficult for, uh, for I, it's very difficult for women in this society. But once uh, I, I can attest to once you be, once you're in it, it's, uh, it would be much easier if we could um, not have the, what the, the modern um, pressures are, I guess. Um, and, and to realize that you can feel fulfilled within uh, Judaism and, uh, you know, that each, each part of what you do is a huge mitzvah and that it's beautiful. So um, I actually, I recommend this for, for every woman in the society, just so that you can feel strength in um, and who you are and to find your place in, in Yiddishkeit because I think that's one of the most important things especially for Baal Shuvas, I think um, because we a lot of us feel feel lost and that we have to like give up our whole lives and who we are but um, you know finding your place in orthodoxy is a really beautiful and fulfilling thing thanks guys <laughs> I hope I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> thank you for thank you for sharing. Always Thanks, good. Esther. That was great. Thank you. Skoya. You're muted, Rabbi. Rabbi, you're muted. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> I just want, I was just gonna say that everybody did such a great job, all professional and everything. <laughs> And then I mute myself. Um, so uh, wonderful work. I, I'm I'm glad. Uh, I don't have to mansplain anything that uh, you guys said. You did, you did wonderfully. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to answer a question somebody gave me. Why somebody asked why this topic now? I mean, this is this is the pre shavuot you know class. Over the last few years we've been doing it on Zoom. Uh, two years ago because we had to, last year because we wanted to, uh, but uh, we we're always talking about Turkey Avot, uh, getting the Torah, Arsina. Like, what is what is a women, what is biographies of women, what does that have to do with anything? So I just want to explain a very, very important point. Shavuot celebrates Hashem's giving of the Torah to the Jewish people on Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. The Torah tells us that the Jews were commanded to be nachonim, to behave themselves for three days before the Torah was given at Mount, Mount Sinai. Specifically, and I'm not going to get into great detail here, but specifically men and women were told not to have relations during those days for three days. This had to be, this whole event of getting the Torah had to be done in some sort of level of purity so high that, that sexual relations uh, creates a kind of tuma and impurity that the Jewish people were not supposed to have at this time. Now, again, without getting into too much of the details of the biology, Rashi points out, look at Rashi there on the spot. And Rashi there points out that men only need one day for that kind of purity to come back. It's the women who needed the three days. So it seems it was critically important for the women to be pure and present at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. What better way to celebrate the holiday than to reconnect women to their birthright, to Torah? Tonight's class, again, is sponsored by the White Family in Merit of a Speedy Recovery for Chaya Hinda Bad Rasha, Vicky White. I hope to see everyone at our weekly Chabruta one-on-one -on -one learning Wednesday nights, the Parsha class on the Midbar this week, Thursday night, and our Shavuot program coming up right after Shabbat. Everybody should have a good night. If you have any questions, I'll stick around, but uh, I'm gonna, if, if anybody needs to go, I understand. I'm gonna stop the live feed to Facebook. Everybody should have a good night.